Welcome to Israel Explained, where we help you understand Israel, Israel's neighbors, and provide you with context to understand the Middle East. My name is Avery Chenault, and I'm joined by Passages Resident Scholar Josiah McGee. Today, we're discussing why Israel is the historical and ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. As anti-Semitism around the world continues to rise, many people justify their anti-Semitic actions by saying that Israel is a colonial state or a colonial project. Today, we're giving you context for why this simply isn't true and why the Jewish people are indigenous to the land of Israel. So Josiah, to start off our conversation today, can you um, tell us a little bit about why this topic matters? Sure. Well, it's a very highly politicized issue. And the reason why it matters so much is because of the way that the narrative on both sides of the issue is weaponized for different purposes. Mm -hmm. So the Jewish people, and we have to acknowledge from the start, for nearly 2,000 years, they were not in the land of Israel in the sense that they were sovereign in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. There was a Jewish presence, but they were not there in the sense that they didn't have a state or a country. There was a, a Jewish state or a country in the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. That basic fact, in many cases, has been used as sort of a weapon against the modern state of Israel as proof, offered as proof that Israel is a, you know, some sort of colonial enterprise that has been stealing land from the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. It's illegitimate and doesn't have the right to exist. Mm -hmm. So it's a serious issue because if, if that's true, then Israel is you know, guilty of some sins. It, it is not perhaps actually an entity that has a right to exist. Mm -hmm. But in order to understand if that is true, that Israel is stealing land as opposed to living in land that has been a part of Jewish history for many, many, many centuries, mm -hmm. we have to ask some questions like, okay, were the Jews there originally? You know, are they in fact from the land of Israel? Do they have a connection to the land of Israel? Why did they leave? Mm -hmm. Was it voluntary or not? Where did they go? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, eventually we have to also answer the question how they came back. Maybe this is a subject for another video, mm -hmm. but these are some of the questions that we have to ask and answer if we're going to really deal with this you know, difficult subject. Yeah. So given that information you just gave us, how do we know that the Jewish people are indigenous to the land of Israel? Sure. Well, for starters, I think it's it's challenging. The, the term indigenous in and of itself is a loaded term. Mm -hmm. Their definition is a little bit complicated, and I'm not a huge fan of that term, actually, because it in and of itself is politicized quite mm -hmm. a bit, the use of the, the term indigenous. Typically, it's defined as something like originating from, belonging to, or having a connection to some sort of place, mm -hmm. piece of land. The challenge in the use of the term indigenous is that it's very difficult to prove positively that an entire people group originated from one place, mm -hmm. that this is where they're from originally from. And so if you look at the Jewish people, for example, in their own history, they're, they're not actually originally from the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. Abraham is from the land of Ur, of the Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. The Bible is very clear about this. Jewish history is very clear about this. The same thing is also true, by the way, of many Palestinians who are making these claims about indig indigeneity. They also migrated. They're not originally from the land. Mm -hmm. They migrated there from someplace else. But both Jewish people and Palestinians do have some claim to being indigenous in the sense that they have a very strong connection to the land. So they belong, in a sense, to the land. They derive their identity to a significant degree from the land and what it means to them and their community, mm -hmm. even if they and their ancestors were born somewhere else. Now, there's a couple of different ways in which you can identify the, the Jewish connection to the land mm -hmm. and how we can determine whether or not this is a deep-rooted sense of connection. Mm -hmm. The first one is language. Mm -hmm. The second one is archaeology, which we can maybe unpack a little bit in a moment. But language, I think, is really key. I, I want to also just reference this briefly. When it comes to language, it's important to understand the etymology of different terms. Mm -hmm. How did we get terms like Jewish? Or how did we get terms like Palestinian? These are important. The history of these terms tell you a lot about the story that both people have and the connection to the, to the land. The term Jewish is actually a derivative of the term Judah. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people understand that, but it's an important historical reality that it's actually essentially a, a derivative of the term Judah, something that passed down through you know, various languages, Latin being one of them. And it 
is a direct reference to both a geopolitical area mm -hmm. that is referred to in ancient texts, both biblical, Roman, and others, known as Judah, also mm -hmm. a kingdom, a biblical kingdom that existed in the, in the land of Israel called Judah, mm -hmm. the counterpart to Israel, the second biblical kingdom. You also have this term Palestinian that is, again, steeped in a lot of history that people need to understand. It's a term that was not used until the Romans actually started to use it. Mm -hmm. I should say it was used in other derivatives. It, it is a derivative of the term Philistine, actually. So it refers to an ancient enemy of the, mm -hmm. the Israelites or the, the Hebrew people. But it really wasn't used in the, in the let's say, pre-modern era, except for the fact that the Romans used it. Mm -hmm. So the Romans are going to use it as a way of actually denying the Jewish people in their existence or their, their connection to the land when they get mad at the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So they, they use it af after they put down a Jewish rebellion. They rename it Syria, Palestina, the whole area, as a, as a new political term that was designed to erase Jewish connection to the land. Mm -hmm. So this idea of a Palestinian identity, it's true that over time people moved and migrated to this land and they formed a sense of identity that was connected to the land and was inherently Palestinian. Mm -hmm. But the origins of that term are actually Roman. And the origins of the term Jewish are also, in many cases, a result of the historical realities of different you know, geopolitical or political terms being used in the ancient world. Yeah, that's very helpful information. So you talked a little bit earlier about different archaeological finds proving that there is a Jewish connection to Israel. Can you give us right. a few examples of some of these archaeological finds? There's so many. There's so many. I mean, you've, you've been on a trip... A few times, I know. So yeah. you've, I'm sure, have visited a lot of these places, mm -hmm. and you know just the entire country of Israel is like a museum, basically. Really, it, it is, it, yeah. It's amazing. I think there's a few that really that stand out as being particularly interesting when it comes to establishing a historical, political reality that is a Jewish state, country, kingdom, whatever you prefer, mm -hmm. in, in the land of Israel. And a lot of it has to do with archaeological sites which definitively prove both the stories of the Bible being true and the the sites and the people involved being real sites mm -hmm. or real people that you can actually see and, and study today. So, for example, it's, it's key that we have archaeological sites that confirm Abraham was a real person. We have archaeological sites that confirm that the kings of Israel were real people, mm -hmm. King David, King Hezekiah, two of the, the most well-known, probably, mm -hmm. in a lot of archaeological sites dealing with those two. Mm -hmm. You also have key places proving that key towns existed, so places mm -hmm. like Megiddo or Beersheba or Jericho, a fascinating site, Jericho, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, obviously. So these are all really important because they, they confirm these, these names of people and names of places confirm that the stories of the Bible are true and also that there was a a very real Jewish political reality in the time of the Bible in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. You you can see some specific proofs of when it relates to this Jewish political reality in the land of the Bible. When it comes to stories of people like King David and King Hezekiah, especially King David, it, it's ironic, actually, places like the city of David in Jerusalem don't actually prove much about the life of David mm -hmm. because there's very few references, if any, to King David in the city of David. Yeah. There are other references to him in his name in artifacts that are found in Israel's north, also near the Dead Sea. King Hezekiah, ironically, city of David has a lot to do with King Hezekiah. You can see Hezekiah's tunnel mm -hmm. that he, he built there. You can also see an insignia belonging to King Hezekiah in the mm -hmm. city of David, proving he was, in fact, a real person who was actually ruling in Jerusalem at this time. You also have other examples like the city of Lachish or Hezekiah's wall in the old city of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. which are proving not only was he ruling, but also that the biblical account of the Jewish people in the land of the Bible is reconciled with or consistent with other ancient historical accounts, like the that of the Assyrians. Mm -hmm. The Assyrians were an empire that attacked the land of, land of the Bible, the biblical kingdom. And Hezekiah's account of having to defend Jerusalem and the rest of his kingdom against the Assyrians is proven true by these different archaeological sites mm -hmm. and the story that they tell. So it's it's very definitively clear based on all of this evidence that, one, the Bible is true, 
And second, what it has to say about the Jewish people actually living in the land of Bible, actually forming a community, a society, a government, forms of worship, like all of these things are are true because mm-hmm. of what the archaeology and the historical records tell us. Yeah. You were talking a little bit about some of the archaeological finds in Israel, and there just being so many of them. It really is overwhelming. It's mm-hmm. it's like a, it's a living museum, and it really does bring the Bible to life and history to life in so many ways. Yeah. But in the past, there has been some controversy over some of these different archaeological sites. So can you explain to us a little bit why there's been so much controversy? Yeah, I think it gets to a lot of, again, this, this issue of like the politicization of identity and connection Mm -hmm. and and trying to determine who actually owns or who actually built what what does this actually prove in terms of who was here first or during what time period all these sorts of things so i'll give you an an example one that i I didn't mention just now but easily could have is some key archaeological evidence for both the bible and the jewish people being the land of israel is some of what herod built for example Mm -hmm. places like masada or mm-hmm. Caesarea. You know, nobody really disputes the fact that King Herod built these places. Mm-hmm. They're remarkable. They're amazing yeah. fortresses or, or cities that he and his his descendants built. Now, what is disputed is who actually built the Temple Mount, for example, mm-hmm. or what actually stood there yeah. on the Temple Mount. So for the Jewish people, this is incredibly important mm-hmm. because this really gets to, again, the the way that the land is key to their sense of belonging, to the sense that they are a community, that there's something that they share in common, mm-hmm. that there's a, an identity, a national identity that is the Jewish people, a lot of it has to do with their connection to Jerusalem or to the, the connection of their the worship that they participated in corporately. Mm-hmm. And... It is key to to acknowledge here, just just briefly, this is an entirely separate video, a whole other subject, that Judaism is complicated. It is both an ethnicity and a religion mm-hmm. combined. It's complicated, a little bit messy. We're not going to get into all of that. But the fact that there is shared history of worship around a key central location, like the Temple Mount, is core to Jewish identity, has been for many centuries. Mm-hmm. And to the sense that there is a shared national experience, Mm -hmm. shared history. The Temple Mount is really, really important because this is where it took place. You know, we're talking about the place where first Solomon and later Herod are going to build these temples. I should say Herod expands upon the one that is built after the Babylonian exile. Mm -hmm. And it's the place where Jewish people are going to come. They're going to offer sacrifices. It is a place in which they revere as being central to their experience, their historical experience, and also mm-hmm. the connection that they continue to share with each other and with the land even today. Mm-hmm. Now, for Palestinians, this is a bit of an issue because the Temple Mount is also symbolically very important to Palestinians, enough so that they're, they're not going to refer to it as the Temple Mount. They might even deny that there is this sort of Jewish history in the space. They'll refer to it as Al-Aqsa, mm-hmm. the Al-Aqsa compound, the Al-Aqsa mosque. There's mm-hmm. two buildings that currently stand in the Temple Mount today, you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is standing over the southern steps, overlooking the southern steps. You have the Dome of the Rock, which is more kind of like center of the platform. And this reveres a site that is the third holiest site in Islam. Mm-hmm. Okay, So we're talking about the place where tradition holds that Muhammad ascends to heaven. It's been revered by the Muslim world for many, many centuries. And... After Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia, this is the third holy site in Islam. So it's it's very culturally, religiously, symbolically very important to Palestinians and to the Muslim world more broadly. And that's so that they're going to have an issue acknowledging that the Jewish people also have a cultural or religious tie to this specific physical place. Yeah. And the way that that manifests itself can, can have some very real world consequences. Mm-hmm. So there are cases in which there have been bitter disputes over archaeological excavations, whether they should be allowed or not. Mm -hmm. There are frequently international diplomatic issues between Israel and Jordan, other countries in the Arab world, even the United Nations, everybody trying to weigh in on custodianship slash jurisdiction Mm -hmm. over the Temple Mount or Al-Aqsa, all these things. So it it really plays itself out in very real world ways because both sides need this place to prove 
that there is a cultural, religious, national significance mm -hmm. to the place that helps inform their identity and why they belong yeah. in this place. Yeah. Well, you were uh, talking a little bit about how some of these different archaeological finds and who actually owns them and who has the right to be there and things like that can be a very messy issue. Um, but from what I'm hearing you say, there always has been a Jewish presence in the land of Israel. Why is this something that is so debated now? Is there something that happened to make this such a debate that it is now? Sure. Well, there's always been a small Jewish presence in the land, even after you know, the, the last 2,000 years in which they, they didn't have a continual sovereign presence. There was a, there was a small presence. Mm -hmm. The issue is that they didn't have sovereignty. They didn't have a government, an organized society. They were part of some other empire's rule over, over the territory. Even during the Roman period, this was true, mm -hmm. but they had a little bit more autonomy during the Roman period. You know, they, they were allowed sort of this symbolic king king herod to rule mm -hmm. and that sort of thing and this sort of gap in jewish history in which they go from having at least a symbolic king to having no government in the land for 2000 years leads to some revisionist history i think mm -hmm. where people are going to take advantage of this to argue that maybe that ancient history isn't actually true yeah look at this big gap you know this there's no way that the Jewish people could have this history if there's such a gap in the in the story, so to speak. But I think people need to understand why that gap exists. You know, why did you go from having these biblical kingdoms, these amazing stories of figures like King Saul, King David, mm -hmm. King Solomon, their descendants, King Hezekiah, you know, these, these amazing stories, and then eventually, you know, King Herod building these amazing fortresses and in, in the, the architectural accomplishments are astonishing yeah. to 2,000 years of no government. Mm -hmm. What happened is that the Romans essentially grew tired of the Jewish people and, and vice versa. The Jewish people were increasingly rebelling against the Roman Empire. And in 70 AD, there came kind of a, a flashpoint in which the Romans tried to put down the rebellion. So they're, they're going to destroy Jerusalem at this point. There'll be a series of rebellions until about 130 to 132 AD as well. Mm -hmm. But over this period, the Romans are not just going to destroy Jerusalem. They're also going to forcibly expel the Jewish people from the land of Israel mm -hmm. into what's known as the exile or another term for it is the diaspora, the yeah. scattering of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think people necessarily understand or people should understand and, and need to sort of wrestle with this that the diaspora was not a voluntary experience. Yeah, It's not like the Jewish people all of a sudden decided – the land's not that important to us. Mm -hmm. It's it's not where we belong. We don't have to be here. We can live anywhere and still be the Jewish people. No, they were forcibly, physically, violently expelled from the mm -hmm. land of Israel and forced into this experience of diaspora scattering. It wasn't something that they chose. Yeah. But that's a really important historical reality to, to wrestle with. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the diaspora was like? Um, how did the Jewish people maintain their connection to Israel? It's a good question. And there's a lot of history here. A lot of it has to do with the experience of the of the Jewish people in North Africa, mm -hmm. in Europe. It, it's complicated because different communities handled it differently. You know, it was easier for the Jewish people in other parts of the Middle East or North Africa mm -hmm. to maintain certain customs than it was for the Jewish people in Europe to maintain certain customs. Mm -hmm. So it really kind of depends on on where the Jewish people spread to which part of the diaspora you were a part of yeah. and which traditions or rituals you maintained. Mm -hmm. I should note that it it is very important to pick up on the fact, like I just mentioned, they didn't all go to Europe. You know, the Jewish people are not a, some European people group that just yeah. kind of chose to migrate to the Middle East mm -hmm. in the 18 and 1900s. No, it, it, was, it was a group that came from the Middle East and spread around not just Europe, but also North Africa and the Middle East and, and even into parts of Asia. Yeah. Now, the, the ways that they, as a whole, tried to maintain some sort of connection, it typically had something to do with maintaining at least one ritual mm -hmm. related to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So most of the Jewish communities around the world would, even in, in the diaspora, maintain a sense of longing for Jerusalem, mm -hmm. whether that's praying towards Jerusalem, 
praying about Jerusalem, mm-hmm. praying for a return to Jerusalem or to Zion. It's very central. It yeah. doesn't really matter what part of the diaspora. This was a central part of mm-hmm. Jewish identity, was longing for a return to Zion or to, or to Jerusalem. And also, you can see it even in some traditions that maybe people are more familiar with, like shattering a glass yeah. during a Jewish wedding. Mm-hmm. What is that all about? It, it's actually a reference to the longing to return to Jerusalem. It'll, yeah. It's a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem and the longing for the return to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. So all of these customs are not just things that they do for fun. I mean, it would be weird to just break a glass for fun at a wedding. Yeah. It's, it's, there's meaning to it. There's yeah. a deeper meaning, and that is remembering, recognizing, and expressing a longing for the connection that they have, mm-hmm. even after 2,000 years of exile. Yeah. A longing for the land of Israel. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear how the Jewish people in the diaspora continue to keep that longing for Israel, even at weddings, which are a celebration of still remembering longing to return. That's really interesting to hear. So on the other hand, I've heard some people argue that, no, it was the Palestinians that were there first, or sometimes Palestinian Christians will argue, oh, well, we were the ones that have been here since Jesus' time. So how do we make sense of all of this in light of what we've just discussed? You know, the the Palestinian Christian perspective is unique. Mm -hmm. And I I think as Christians, we do need to be be careful here not to just ignore that perspective because it's true. Many Christian communities that consider themselves Palestinian or are Arabic speaking have a credible claim to having been around since the time of Jesus. They've been there a very long time, and there's a lot of rich history and tradition they have to share with Mm -hmm. the rest of the the Christian world. And it's important to honor and respect respect them for what they have to offer. At the same time, though, I think it's it's tricky because you don't want to get sucked into this zero-sum game Mm -hmm. where my perspective or identity means that another perspective— or identity is invalid yeah. and, and must be rejected entirely in order mm-hmm. to, to support mine. Because the reality is that the Jewish people were also there. The fact that Palestinian Christians were there is true, mm-hmm. but doesn't change the fact that Jewish people also were there at the time of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Jesus was a Jewish person. <laughs> yeah, we, we forget that all the time. He, yeah. he was a very Jewish person who mm-hmm. lived a Jewish life, taught from Jewish texts, had predominantly Jewish followers, mm-hmm. And the early church was mostly comprised until, really until Paul's missionary journeys where he started to do a lot of outreach to the Gentile world. Mm -hmm. It was comprised mostly of of Jewish followers of Jesus. So it would be a mistake to say that just because Palestinian Christians were there during the time of Jesus, that the Jewish people were not also there. Yeah. And that leaves Christians with a, a tricky paradox to try and reconcile Mm -hmm. these these two competing perspectives that the palestinians were there some palestinians were there i should say Mm -hmm. that the jewish people were also there and i I think it it requires us as christians to think carefully yeah to think critically to be compassionate and respectful of course Mm -hmm. but also to seek opportunities to make peace where we can Mm -hmm. and that has to start with just telling the truth. Yeah. The, the truth is that both parties have some claim to a very deep cultural, historical, religious connection to the land of Israel. It's going to be virtually impossible to convince the other side that's not true mm-hmm. because it is true. Yeah. They have these connections. But we can't be trapped again into the zero-sum game, and we have to be willing to speak the truth with love and with clarity yeah. in order to make peace. Absolutely. Just just my opinion. Yeah. Well, these are a lot of sometimes can be very complex issues. So thank Mm -hmm. you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. And to our audience, thank you so much for watching. If you'd like more resources or would like to learn more, check out some of the notes in the description and follow us on Instagram. If you have questions, leave a comment below and we'd love to answer your question. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.